Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. Radio amateurs pitch in to help as three coastal nor'easters hit the New England coast and more. Chinese over-the-horizon radar appears on the 40-meter band. Congress may consider modifying regulations to allow for more stringent pirate radio fines. 80 young radio amateurs will be attending an on-the-air camp in South Africa. Gates Air suspends the sale of commercial AM broadcast transmitters. The FCC tells a California technology developer that the launch of its Space B satellites was not approved. And NASA is sending a new probe to fly in the sun's corona this summer, and your name can be on board. We will tell you how to put it there in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will be here to discuss Wi-Fi and why it's really bad to send or receive email attachments. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLAB, discusses coax loss versus connector loss. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, will be here with another edition of his Amateur Radio History Headlines. And we will conclude a talk given by Tom Pereira, W1TP, as we listen to part two of his talk given at the Dayton Hamvention entitled Clandestine Communications During World War II. That's all straight ahead, as edition number 995 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio facility located in the Sector of Desolation in Albany, New York, I'm W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau in Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from the western Catskills of New York State, where mud season is in full swing, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. Reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, from the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. Reporting from the K9IG News Bureau in cold and windy Franklin, Indiana, I'm Amy Jo Clark. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Leading off this week's news comes word that amateur radio volunteers with WX1BOX at the National Weather Service in Taunton, Massachusetts, and various Aries groups had their hands full during March as Mother Nature's hat trick of nor'easters brought severe weather conditions and a lot of snow to the northeastern U.S. For more details on this story, we go to Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, who is standing by at League Headquarters in Newington. The storms caused the Cape Cod Aries team to extend activations for Skywarn, WX1BOX, and shelter operations. The first in the trio of nor'easters on March 2nd and 3rd brought mostly heavy rain and wet snow to parts of Massachusetts, Connecticut, eastern New York, and northern New England. Strong to damaging winds swept central and southern New England, with hurricane force gusts across southeastern New England and Cape Cod and the islands. The storm caused severe coastal flooding across multiple high tide cycles. WX1BOX volunteers were active for 17 hours straight, and afterwards some continued to monitor high tides and strong winds, which persisted into the weekend. The volunteers handled more than 1,000 reports of wind damage, with wind gusts measured at 40 miles per hour or higher, localized road flooding from heavy rainfall and coastal flooding. At the height of the storm, nearly a half million customers in Massachusetts alone lost electrical power. Eastern Massachusetts Aries was on standby, and Cape Cod Aries was active for several days with a regional sheltering operation until power was largely restored to Cape Cod. Only a few days later, a second nor'easter brought heavier snowfall to southern New England, although winds and coastal flooding were not as severe as in the first storm. In the interior of southern New England, temperatures hovering around freezing meant heavy wet snow, sparking another round of downed trees and power lines and nearly a half million customers without power in Massachusetts and Connecticut. 
The third storm turned out to be a major nor'easter and blizzard that affected the entire New England region with heavy snowfall, two feet or more in more northern areas. Wind gusts greater than 70 miles per hour across Cape Cod and the islands, combined with the weight of wet snow, took down trees and utility lines. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX. This was a very active period of significant severe weather for the region after a relatively quiet stretch from late January through the end of February, observed Rob Macedo, KD1CY, the Eastern Massachusetts Assistant Section Emergency Coordinator for Skywarn. Some of the highest astronomical tides of the year, coupled with wind gusts of more than 70 miles per hour and as high as 93 miles per hour at the Barnstable County, Massachusetts Emergency Operations Center to trigger some of the worst coastal flooding in decades, Mosita recounted. Mark Stern, WA1R, guarded the HF net on 75 meters during the nor'easter. Eastern Massachusetts Section Emergency Coordinator Mark Kazubel, KB1NCG, reported. WC1MAB at the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency Region 2 headquarters was also active through the efforts of Mike Ligger, N1YLQ. At WX1BOX, another 14 hours of Skywarn operations ensued. Amateur radio nets in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island fielded reports of heavy snowfall, including thunder snow, wet snow damage, strong gusty winds, heavy rainfall, and minor coastal flooding. Widespread snowfall amounts totaled up to 16 inches in interior southern New England. As much as 30 inches of snow fell in western Massachusetts, as well as in parts of New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine. Macedo said it became clear from Skywarn reports that the region would experience extended power outages. These reports were noted by state emergency management and the media and used to inform the public about storm risk and to prepare and act accordingly. Skywarn nets were also active in the greater New York City area, reporting damage from wet snow, strong winds, thunder snow, and snowfall totals. Minor coastal flooding also occurred at high tide, but lower astronomical tides again precluded a more significant coastal flood event, Macedo said. Eastern Massachusetts Aries went on standby one more time after the blizzard warnings were posted. Skywarn nets were active throughout the region, gathering snowfall and wind reports from around southern New England. WX1BOX volunteers were on duty for 16 hours, bringing the monthly total to 47, Macedo said. The National Weather Service forecast office is in the process of moving, but antennas for VHF and UHF were left in place, and volunteers provided their own gear to operate over the course of these three nor'easters. Wind gusts well into the hurricane range were recorded on Cape Cod, along with significant damage from the wet snow, and seven Cape Cod Aries volunteers provided communication at shelters, as cell phone service was disrupted during the blizzard. Cape Cod Aries District Emergency Coordinator Franco Laughlin, WQ1O, said that volunteers seamlessly transitioned from providing situational awareness to addressing communication failures. He said six ham volunteers supported the regional shelter operation, and two of them put in more than 50 straight hours. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 Monitoring System reports that one of China's over-the-horizon radar installations has been causing interference in the amateur radio 7 MHz band. The IAR-UMS February newsletter reports on that intruder and others. Other top five intruders include a single-letter beacon transmitting either the letter K or the letter T on 7039.3 kHz. The source is believed to be the Russian Pacific in the Petrolex Klamchatki area of Russia. A Russian F-1B teleprinter signal has appeared at 7193 kHz with an encrypted frequency shift keyed 50 baud signal originating in Kaliningrad. Authorities in Germany and Switzerland have filed official complaints. A Russian Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplex, or OFDM-60 signal, has been showing up on the 14.235 MHz, covering 2.76 kHz. It's said to be located in Moscow. Three Russian OFDM-60 signals were active in the same time on February 13th. 
A Russian F-1B signal has been observed at 14.308 MHz, 50 baud, 500 Hz shift, also reported to be in Moscow. In the miscellaneous or bad news category, IAR-UMS Region 1 Coordinator Wolf Heidel, DK2OM, reports Spanish-speaking fishermen at 3560 kHz USB, heard daily at 1600 UTC or later. The signals have been heard on other 80-meter frequencies. Broadcaster Radio Harjisa in Somaliland continued to be reported at 7.120 MHz in AM daily. And on 7.175 MHz, Radio Eritrea continues to be jammed daily with white noise transmissions attributed to Radio Ethiopia. The third harmonic of Radio Tajik on 4.765 kHz is still being heard at 14.295 MHz. <laughs> Produced by amateurs, for amateurs, and originating from Albany, New York, you're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Could Congress be ready to take a stand on more stringent penalties for pirate radio operators? There may be an answer to that question after discussion of a draft bill known as the Pirate Act on March 22nd. Authored by Reps Leonard Lance, Republican New Jersey, and Paul Tonko, Democrat New York, Members of the House Subcommittee on Communications and Technology, the Pirate Act, short for Preventing Illegal Radio Abuse Through Enforcement, proposes to amend Title V of the Communications Act of 1934 to increase fines for illegal pirate operations and give the Federal Communications Commission additional authority to penalize pirate radio operators. The proposed draft language calls for an increased penalty for anyone who willfully participates in a facilitating of a pirate radio broadcast. That penalty, which is today $10,000 per violation, would potentially carry a fine of $100,000 a day for each day of broadcast with a maximum fine of $2 million. The draft legislation also calls on the FCC's Enforcement Bureau to conduct enforcement sweeps across the nation's top five radio markets to identify and terminate illegal broadcasts. The draft clarifies that the FCC should also continue regular enforcement efforts throughout the year. The proposed act would also give state and local governments the authority to impose additional civil or criminal penalties for those who facilitate illegal broadcasting, which would be on top of any existing FCC authority. The word facilitate carries additional weight. The proposed legislation clarifies that facilitate means that anyone who aids a pirate radio operator can be indicted as well as those who provide housing, facilities, or financing to a radio operator. That means that landlords, property managers, and advisors would be pulled into the sweep. In September of 2017, the FCC took its first step in that direction when it penalized an unlicensed radio operator and the owner of the building where the equipment was housed with a fine of $150,000, the largest fine to date. FCC Commissioner Michael O'Reilly had been calling for more congressional authority to address the illegal pirate broadcasts. He told Radio World in March that increasing fines for pirate broadcasts will have the effect of triggering enactment thresholds at the Department of Justice. If these fines are at paltry levels, they tend to focus on bigger cases. Increasing the fines does have an impact on that side, he said. He also said in a recent Twitter post that he is very pleased that the committee was planning to examine a draft bill to enact stiffer penalties and give the FCC new tools to fight pirate radio. The act also gives the commission authority to dispose of illegal pirate radio equipment after a 90-day window. The draft was up for discussion at a subcommittee hearing held on March 22nd. Among those who spoke is David Donovan, President and Executive Director of the New York State Broadcasters Association. The hearing webcast will be available at the Energy and Commerce Committee website. When a prominent radio engineer passed along word to us that he'd sought a quote from the manufacturer on a new transmitter, but was told the company had discontinued the model, and was assessing its AM line, he sought to learn more. Chief Product Officer Rich Redman at Gates Air replied, recent changes in long-term availability of critical components from our suppliers, including several last time buy notices, have caused us to take proactive steps to ensure that we can meet our continued support obligation of our AM products, he said. To safeguard our ability to offer an ample supply of spare components and to secure the ongoing field support of our AM transmitters, Gates Air has taken the responsible step of suspending new AM transmitter sales and will instead focus on supporting existing customers' transmitters with our available components.
He said warranty, field service, phone support, spare parts, and repairs continue as normal for Gates Air AM products. Flexiva, DAX, DX, and 3DX transmitters all had a number of obsolete components that influenced the decision. Gates Air is currently in the advanced technology assessment phase for the development of an updated line of AM transmitters, Redmond said. The company, formerly part of the old Harris Broadcast, has deep roots in AM and its Flexiva line ranges in power from 1 kilowatt to 2 megawatts. The news has no impact on the FM transmitter lines. He was asked if engineers should read this as a backing away in general from AM by Gates Air. He replied that they continue to be committed to all radio customers, and this includes AM. We've always taken our long-term support seriously, hence the steps we have chosen to take to be able to ensure continued support of our customers in the field. It is always simple for a supplier to declare lifetime support, but we believe it is more important to be upfront about the challenges of shrinking component life cycles and in some cases make difficult choices to continue support. AM transmission uses very different RF device technology as compared to FM, DAB, and television transmitters and requires a new approach for the next generation of AM systems. We are excited about some of the advances that are applicable to AM, driven in part by new developments for electric cars that will enable us to bring to market high efficiency, compact, and modularity in transmitter design to AM broadcasters. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. 80 young hams between the ages of 16 and 26 will be in South Africa August 8th through the 15th for the 2018 Youngsters on the Air, or Yoda Camp, hosted by South African Radio League, the SARL. A summer camp in past years, this time it will become the Yoda Winter Camp, since it takes place in the Southern Hemisphere. The annual event brings together young people from International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 and elsewhere for one week, offering an opportunity to become acquainted with different nationalities and cultures, foster international friendship and goodwill, and of course, learn new amateur radio skills. It's expected that the young radio amateurs will spend some time at the helm of the camp station ZS9YOTA, SARL President Nick Von Rensberg, ZS6QL, said that hosting the 2018 Yoda Winter Camp would be a golden opportunity for the SARL and amateur radio in South Africa to make their mark in promoting amateur radio among the younger generation. This event is a unique opportunity for introducing young people to technical careers in science and technology and an investment prospect for industry to help shape the future of technology training, Van Rensburg said. SARL pointed out that the 2018 Yoda Camp would be a first for Africa and a first for South Africa. This year's participants will come from Europe, Asia, and Africa. SARL is seeking contributions to help support the event. IARU Region 1 is a major financial contributor of the Yoda event. Among other activities, the Yoda campers will build a transceiver, create a backer set to fly on high-altitude balloons, learn about each other, and focus on how to take amateur radio forward in their own country, SARL said. In announcing the camp late last year, SARL and the South African Yoda Working Group promised an unforgettable African experience that will be remembered for many years to come. Dr. Gary Immelman, ZS6YI, is the event's patron. Last summer, 80 young people attended Yoda Summer Camp in England, sponsored by the Radio Society of Great Britain. Two young radio amateurs from the U.S. were among those attending the 2016 Yoda Summer Camp in Austria. Hamvention 2018 is May 18th through the 20th at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio. The ARRL is planning a large display at this year's event, and to find out what that is, we go to Carla Pereira, KC1, 
HSX reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. The largest annual amateur radio gathering in the U.S., this year's event has been sanctioned as the 2018 ARRL Great Lakes Division Convention. The theme for this year's hamvention is amateur radio serving the community. ARRL has responded in that spirit, and four ARRL-sponsored forums, to include many guest presenters, will comprise a public service communications track on Friday and Saturday of hamvention. Getting Started in Public Service Communications, an introduction to public service communication training and emergency preparedness, will take place on Friday at 9.15 a.m., moderated by Ken Bailey, K1FUG, the ARRL Emergency Preparedness Assistant and Continuing Education Program Administrator. He will cover the many ways that radio amateurs serve their communities in good times and in bad. Building partnerships with ARRL Emergency Preparedness Manager Mike Corey, KI1U, and FEMA Community Partner Specialist External Affairs Sarah Byrne as co-presenters will get underway at 11.50 a.m. on Friday. Acknowledging that collaborative and mutually beneficial partnerships are key to successful disaster and emergency response, this session will explore how amateur radio public service groups rely on such partnerships when serving their communities. Corey and Byrne will address how to build and grow partnerships of different levels of complexity across a wide range of interests and organizations, from voluntary organizations active in disasters, or VOADs, to other nonprofit and commercial entities. Corey also will moderate a panel discussion on Saturday at 9.15 a.m. This session will offer a chance to hear from representatives of Amateur Radio's largest organizations and partnerships active during times of disaster and emergency. Stories from the 2017 Hurricanes is ARRL's final forum in the Public Service Communications Track. It will take place at 1.30 p.m. on Saturday. ARRL has included special guests to share first-hand accounts of Amateur Radio's response to the 2017 Hurricanes in Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, and across the southeastern U.S. On hand will be ARRL Section Manager for Puerto Rico, Oscar Resto, KP4RF, U.S. Virgin Islands Section Manager, Fred Kleber, K9BV, and Andy Anderson, KE0AYJ, who was among the amateur radio operators organized by ARRL as American Red Cross volunteers who deployed to Puerto Rico in the wake of Hurricane Maria. Anderson and fellow volunteer and Hamvention Amateur of the Year, Val Hotsfeld, NV9L, who also deployed to Puerto Rico, will be keynote speakers at the 2018 ARRL Donor Recognition Reception on the Thursday evening before Hamvention. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX. People who attend three or more of the AWRL-sponsored public service communications forums will earn an AWRL certificate in recognition of their commitment to ham radio public service training and development. Hamvention has also organized activities that fold into this year's public service theme. Preble County, Ohio, ARES Emergency Coordinator Gary Hollenbaugh, NJ8BB, has coordinated a display of mobile emergency communications vehicles and equipment at Hamvention for 10 years. The purpose of the display is to promote emergency communications and for groups who build and operate mobile communications facilities to display their equipment and demonstrate their capabilities, Hollenbaugh said. It's also a chance for the groups to talk about how to develop emergency communications in the field and to exchange ideas with Hamvention visitors. The centerpiece of the AWRL's participation at Hamvention is AWRL Expo 2018, a spacious exhibit area that will be located in Building 2 at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center. Corey and Bailey have organized an amateur radio public service exhibit for AWRL Expo, which will include a small stage and seating so attendees can enjoy 15-minute public service theme presentations throughout the convention. The exhibit will include a display of AWRL ham aid equipment. Ham aid kits were used throughout Puerto Rico for the hurricane relief and recovery effort. Following the 2017 hurricanes, more than 600 donations to supply and resupply the ham aid program were received from radio clubs, individuals, and several amateur radio retailers and manufacturers. Other AWRL highlights at Hamvention 2018 include the popular AWRL Member Forum, moderated by AWRL Great Lakes Division Director Dale Williams, WA8EFK. The AWRL Member Forum at noon on Saturday in Room 3 is your opportunity to hear from national and local AWRL officials on key areas of member interest. 
on Friday at 2.25 p.m. in Room 3, ARRL International Grid Chase 2018. Get in the chase. It will offer an update on ARRL's year-long on-the-air event aimed at working as many grid squares as possible before next year. ARRL Contest Branch Manager Bart Jenke W9JJ will provide tips on participating, uploading your contact data to ARRL's Logbook of the World scoring and awards. The ARRL Collegiate Amateur Radio Initiative Forum will gather on Saturday at 4 p.m. in Room 3. Moderators will be Andy Maluzzi, KK4LWR, and his brother Tony Maluzzi, KD8RTT. A growing number of campus radio clubs and student radio amateurs are sharing ideas and suggestions on the ARRL Collegiate Amateur Radio Initiative Facebook page. They're among those inspiring a renaissance of ham radio on campuses. Collegiate Amateur Radio Initiative provides a space for students to meet and to network. The ARRL Collegiate Amateur Radio Initiative is sponsored in part by the W1YSM Snyder Family Collegiate Amateur Radio Endowment. Reaching the public with ham radio will be the focus on Sunday from 9.15 a.m. to 10.15 a.m. in Room 2. Presenters will be Tommy Gober, N5DUX and ARRL Teachers Institute on Wireless Technology Instructor, and ARRL Marketing Manager Bob Inderbeitson, NQ1R. Many radio clubs organize displays and exhibits to garner interest for amateur radio. They recruit new hams at maker fairs, school and scouting events, county fairs, public events, and science and technology conventions. Clubs also set up displays for the general public during ARRL field day. Participants will learn and share different methods for organizing exhibits and engaging the public at non-radio events. A complete list of Hamvention forums is on the Hamvention website. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Oh, now it's time for me to talk. I was under my desk. Excuse me. <laughs> when you're a tech guy. Hello, everybody. Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. When you're a tech guy, uh, you often go under your desk, right? Am I, am I ringing a bell? You know, you reach under there because there's wiring and stuff. And I had a new wireless charger I needed to plug in. And that meant a trip down below. And it's funny because uh, my, whenever I go underneath this desk... My engineers come running in. It's no, they, it's not that they think I had a heart attack or something and have fallen, but because <laughs> cause they don't like seeing me go down there because they know danger, Will Robinson. I might do something and break things. I didn't. Everything's fine. Charger's working. If you're the type of person that spends a little bit of time cr clambering beneath your desk, this is the show for you. Email is like sending a postcard. Anything that you put in an email, including any attachment to the email, can be read along the way, and it usually goes through multiple servers along the way. So email by itself is not secure. We're seeing that change over time. For instance, if your friend had Gmail and you had Gmail, uh, it would be secure the entire way. It would be encrypted, and it would be fairly safe. But for most of the time, when you send email from one host to another, it's not safe. But... You've heard me say many times, do not send email attachments. There's so many reasons not to do this. First and primary, first and foremost, that email attachments often are contain viruses and are dangerous. Now, your friend is expecting this from you, I presume, and so he'll know and he'll say, oh, yeah, I was expecting this and it's not, you know, it's safe. But often the virus payloads, and this includes ransomware, and this is, by the way, almost always, almost always how people get infected and almost always how businesses get ransomware, and and this was a big problem, remember, last year, is through an attached file that comes from someone you know, that comes from the boss. And that's because it's really easy to spoof email addresses. And uh, so it's a, it's a trivial thing for, for people to, to send an email from somebody you know, or the, it, it now this time of year, we're going to see a lot of fake IRS emails. And if you see an email with an attachment, my friends... Do not open it. And it's not just you I'm protecting. It's your family. It's your network. It's your business. And ultimately, it's the Internet as a whole. 
Security flaws, problems like this, exploits, viruses, malware affect all of us. And if you get infected, the chances are that virus is going to then take your address book and send it to every one of your friends and they'll get infected and so on and so on and so on. Do not send and use and receive and accept email attachments. Stop. Fortunately, mo many email clients these days will refuse to do it. A lot of them won't accept them. That's There's a good reason for that. And actually, this goes nicely with your need to have it secure. Instead of sending an attachment via email, put that attachment on one of the free upload services, Microsoft's OneDrive, Google Drive, Dropbox. There's a million of them. All of them offer you know, a gig or two uh, or more. I think there's five gigabytes free at Google Drive, free. You can encrypt your file if you want to be extra safe. Almost all of these are encrypted anyway in place. But if you if you don't want anybody who works at the company to see it, because that's, by the way, something that does, it could happen. I don't think it's ever happened. But in theory, somebody who worked at Google could look at Google Drive. Somebody who works at Dropbox can look at Dropbox. Somebody who looks at Apple could look at iCloud. So if you're using those services and you really want to be sure it's safe, encrypt it. You, zip will work. You can zip it up and use a password. Maybe not the most secure, but certainly enough to kind of prevent casual snoops. If you need something stronger, there are commercial encryption programs that you can encrypt it. Then upload it to the service. And then instead of sending a file or an attachment, you send your friend a link. Now, I have also said links are not safe either. I always tell people be very careful about clicking links in email, in uh, messages, text messages that's, that could be very dangerous this is another very popular way of spreading viruses but if he's expecting an email from you it comes and you say i'm going to attach it to dropbox it's going to come this afternoon chances are pretty good no hacker knows that information so that's going to be a safe attachment especially if you encrypt it and you say and here's the password now you know it's safe so that's the best way to do that it'll protect you your friend and the internet as a whole from anti, you know, from malware. And it'll make sure that it's secure so that nobody can see it along the way. Actually, Google Drive uh, is 15 gigs, but you share it with your Gmail. That's nice. Apple's five gigs. That's who it is. Apple's iCloud is five gigs. So almost everybody has some access to some uh, cloud storage that you could put a, an attachment on. Do it that way. And I do like the idea of encrypting it and sending the password along with it in a separate email because that really means it's safe. Very dangerous to send email attachments. I can give you example after example. There's there, the only, the only, almost always the so. Remember the Sony Pictures Entertainment? They got hacked via email attachments. Most ransomware email attachments. There was one case. Was it Target? Might have been Target. I think it was. Remember there was a big breach a year or two ago at Target. All their customer accounts and their credit card numbers and everything escaped. That wasn't through an email. That was because Target had a HVAC contractor, people who did the heating and air conditioning in the target offices. And as often is the case, they gave those guys access to the network so that I, I guess so they could bill them. I don't know. There was, there was exchange of files and they, the HVAC contractor got hacked probably with an email. And then that hack was used to get into target. Oh, just, you know, we just be smart. I'm glad you're asking the right question, which is, you know, how do I send email attachments securely? But this, the first step is don't don't send an attachment. Put it put it on a on a service that's safe, and then you can send that. Uh, let's see what else is uh, in the news. You know, copper was designed for voice, not for data. They were able to figure out a way to put data over it some years ago. That's what DSL is, digital subscriber line. And phone company acronyms are awful. <laughs> You, you explain what it stands for and it tells you nothing still. <laughs> the real the real goal, by the way, for them when the phone company, when Ma Bell designed uh, DSL many years ago, they wanted to put movies. They were trying to compete with the cable companies. They wanted to put movies over your phone line. And so they created a, a way to push a movie down a phone line. It turned out nobody wanted that. <laughs> but then, then the internet came along and they said, oh... <laughs> Oh, we can give people internet access this way. It's limited. Uh, it's limited for a couple of reasons. First of all, there's only a, a certain amount of bandwidth you could push down those two, two little copper lines. 
So you can't get DSL does not get super fast, even though they've improved the technology in a variety of ways. And there's other problem is distance. You know, typically uh, DSL will only work about no more than, let's say, two miles from the phone company. So the central office has this the data switch in there and it's pushing it down the line. But after a mile or two, it starts to, you know, get slowed down. It's terrible. So it's kind of a limited service. And, and most people uh, have switched to cable because cable doesn't have that problem. It's a much fat, fatter. It's still a copper pipe, but it's a much fatter copper pipe. And the phone companies for a while were responding by putting in fiber. Verizon was, AT&T was with its U-verse. That's a glass technology. doesn't occupy any more space than those little copper lines, but it can hold a whole heck of a lot more data. In fact, a single strand, which is about roughly about your size of your hair, thinness of your hair, a single one could carry all the phone traffic on Mother's Day on one single line in the United States. All the, It's a huge amount of data. Glass is very efficient, and it's fully digital and, and all of that. Phone companies come in and done something which I don't like, but they call cut the copper. They put in glass lines, and they've cut the copper. Now, there may still be copper. In fact, I'm sure there's still copper in your house. They didn't come in and rewire your house. But going right up to your house is probably uh, glass, or at least down the street is glass. Usually underground. You, can't, you don't really want to put glass on telephone poles. So uh, that's why the DSL companies have said, well, we can't really offer copper service anymore. You don't have it. It's cut. And that's why I don't like it because I think, I think the phone companies cut it because they don't, they don't, they're required by the FCC to offer competing services over those copper wires. They don't like that one bit. So they've taken this opportunity to cut the copper and say, oh, sorry, you got to get your internet from us. Oh, sorry. Oh, dear. So you really now have uh, only a couple of choices in a situation like that. You can get internet service from the phone company or from the cable company. You don't, you've lost a, a lot of competing services. Now, it does sound like some DSL Extreme says you could get fiber. It sounds like there may be still getting permission to run over AT&T's fiber lines, which would be good news. She didn't want Wi-Fi in the house, though. She has a family member who doesn't, who thinks Wi-Fi is dangerous. It's microwave radiation, after all. And doesn't want Wi-Fi in the house. Now, I, I honor that. And if somebody doesn't want Wi-Fi, that's fine. They shouldn't have to have Wi-Fi. They don't have cell phones for the same reason. There's n there are no studies. You, you, there are bogus studies. People will dredge up. But there are no real scientific studies that show Wi-Fi to be dangerous. Not the reason, or cell phones, by the way. The reason is it's so low power. And uh, in order to disrupt your cells, to cause physical damage to your body, there's a certain amount of power needs you need a certain amount of power. Now, radio uh, goes through you all the time. They don't seem to worry about radio and TV going through them, but they're worried for some reason about these higher frequency bandwidths going through them. Now, I know when you, I, as been on radio a long time, when you call, climb up the radio towers, we have a big tower in San Francisco. They call it Sutro Tower. A lot of radio stations and TVs up there. And uh, I went up there once with an engineer friend of mine. We climbed up, and when we got back down, I had white spots on my hand. He said, uh, I said, what are that? What's that? He said, oh, don't worry about that. That's what we call RF burns, radio frequency burns. It, it damaged the skin because you're right there on the tower. That's a lot of energy. And by the way, since then, they've required engineers wear metal mesh suits when they climb up there. <laughs> this is kind of like going up without a safety belt. Uh, I don't think I got cancer, but anyway... <laughs> I did get those little RF burns. So even radio towers can do that. But this is the key on all of this stuff. The amount of power decreases by the square of the distance. It's called the inverse square law. It drops off really, really fast. And so you can be standing next to Sutro Tower without a mesh bunny suit. It's not going to harm you. It's only if you're on the tower. And microwave, those are 100,000 watt transmitters on that tower. A microwave coming out of your Wi-Fi or your cell phone is not megawatts. It's not even watts. It's tiny fractions of a watt. So it's very small to begin with. You could sit on your Wi-Fi router. <laughs> you often do sit on your cell phone and there's no harm to come to you because it's so low power. But it's even less dangerous if you're not sitting on it. <laughs> so as soon as you get more than a few feet away from a Wi-Fi access point, you, you can't, the, the amount of power coming to you is so low that you can't, it doesn't damage it. There's no physical damages. No, it's completely safe, honest. And you'll see bogus studies, just like you'll see bogus studies of vaccines not being safe. 
but there's no real scientific evidence that there's danger to you from cell phone radiation or Wi-Fi. However, I understand somebody doesn't want to get a vaccine or doesn't want to use Wi-Fi or doesn't want to use a cell phone. I, that's your prerogative. And the good news is, uh, even though all these companies, AT&T and everybody, they, when, they, when you get their service, they, everybody wants Wi-Fi, so they, they give you a Wi-Fi router. But here's the good news. You don't have to use it. You can ask them to turn off the Wi-Fi, or you can do it yourself. You can go in the router, turn off the radios. If you want, you can, if you want to be extra safe, disable by disconnecting the antennas. You just unscrew them, and uh, you're safe then. You don't, it's nothing more to worry about. I, I, I honor your fears. I don't want to poo-poo them. Uh, I would like to mention that there's no scientific evidence. However, uh, you know, if you're worried about it, that's fine. So you can get this service. You can get the Wi-Fi access points. Just disable them. You can do that in software in the Wi-Fi interface. And, you know, it's inconvenient. It means you have to connect via a cable whenever you want to get online. But that's, that's your choice. All right. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. The ARRL is looking for a few online mentors. Since the beginning of the Amateur Radio Emergency Communications Training Program, ARRL has relied on the work of mentors to help guide those interested in volunteering to serve their communities. For more on what the League is looking for, we go to Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, who has all the details. Our mentors represent the best in amateur radio public service communications training and make a substantial difference in how students approach service to their communities and the amateur radio. The mentors take the written text of a course and bring it to life for these amateurs, many of whom they will never meet face to face. Our current pool of mentors is low and ARRL has an immediate need for new mentors who are willing to start as soon as they're approved. Mentors are more than teachers. They are the guides that new radio amateurs and those new to public service communications rely on to show them all the possibilities for amateur radio to benefit the public and the partners we work with. ARRL emergency communications training courses cover a wide range of material on the use of radio communications technologies, communication techniques and emergency management skills necessary when helping served agencies deal with and overcome disasters. Mentors for the EC001 Introduction to Amateur Radio Emergency Communications course must be active radio amateurs, general class or higher, who are 18 or older and ARRL members. Applicants should have successfully completed ARRL EC001, have experience in public service communications and ARIES activities, and have have the recommendation of their ARRL section manager. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX. Appointment as an ARRL field instructor or as a mentor for ARRL's public service communications training program is for a term of three years. This is a renewable appointment based on satisfactory performance as an active instructor mentor and satisfaction of all current qualifications and requirements. For more information on applying to be a mentor, contact ARRL Emergency Preparedness Assistant Ken Bailey, K1FUG, at 860-294-0227. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, with Amateur Radio History Headlines. 1963, the ARRL, responding to some complaints about generals being allowed on 75 and 20 meter phone, proposes an incentive licensing system. Under the ARRL proposal, generals and conditionals would lose 75, 40, 20, and 15 meter phone privileges over a two year period. Also in 1963, the building fund to construct the ARRL headquarters at 225 Main Street, Newington is in full swing. The amateur population is over 200,000, but CB licenses now outnumber hams. 1964, a ham in the White House? Barry Goldwater, K7UGA and K3UIG, is the Republican candidate for president. He is defeated. Herbert Hoover dies at the age of 90. 
as Secretary of Commerce in the 1920s and President of the United States from 1929 to 1933, his strong support of amateur radio was invaluable. He lived long enough to see his son, Herbert Hoover Jr., W6ZH, elected President of the ARRL. 1965. The FCC comes out with its own incentive licensing proposal. General and conditional class operators would lose 50% of the 75 through 15 meter phone bands. A new amateur first class license with a 16 word per minute code speed would be the stepping stone between the general and the extra. Advanced class amateurs would not be grandfathered into the first class. Rather, they would be bumped down to general upon renewal. Oscar III and Oscar IV allowed two-way QSOs via satellite. This has been Amateur Radio History Headlines with Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and I'm talking to Connie Marshall, K5CM. And uh, Connie is the man behind the upcoming frequency measuring test on April the 6th. And Connie, what goes on during a frequency measuring test? Well, uh, we start out with a, a call-up. I call up uh, simply uh, using my call, and I typically would call uh, FMT or QST. In some cases, I'll call uh, FMT, QST for three to six minutes. And, you know, I do this, I do this call letters and uh, QST over and over. And then at the end of the three to six minutes, uh, I'll push the key down and hold the carrier down for uh, typically two minutes, sometimes longer, sometimes a little less. And during that three minute or two minute key down period, all the participants have the opportunity to measure my frequency. So the idea is to measure your frequency as accurately as possible. Is that correct? That's correct. There's many different things that affect the accuracy of their measurements, not just their equipment, but the uh, propagation anomalies. To participate in this, Connie, do you have to have really expensive lab-grade equipment, or can anybody do this? No, anyone can do this. Uh, I'm, I'm always amazed at how many different ways people come up with to measure my frequency. <laughs> it's just, uh, <laughs> there's so many ways. I'm always surprised. Well, now, what about the equipment on your end? What are you using? Okay, I do use fairly sophisticated equipment. I use an HP frequency synthesizer, an HP 3336. This is a fairly old piece of equipment, but still very uh, accurate when driven by a GPS reference source. And I use a GPS, uh, an HP Z3801 uh, reference to drive the uh, signal generator. And some people are able to get remarkably close, I've noticed, in measuring your frequency. Well, there's some luck involved, if, if you haven't noticed, but if you're not within ground wave range of me, you always have to deal with the propagation anomalies. In other words, the uh, ionosphere is moving up or moving down, seldom, seldom is it stable. Now, the announcement, uh, just for those who uh, get QST, the announcement appears on page 91 of the April issue of QST that has a lot more details. But, Connie, uh, it starts at 0100 Zulu, is that correct? That's correct. Uh -huh. And that's when you begin your call-up? I'll, I'll do my, well, yes, I'll do my call-up. Sometimes I start a little bit earlier to avoid QRM problems. Okay. Well, I think this is great. I, I wish you luck. Okay. Well, well, we'll be looking forward to you participating. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Connie. <laughs> The deadline to submit nominations for these five ARRL awards that recognize educational and technological pursuits in amateur radio is rapidly approaching. Nominations are also open for the league's premier award to honor a young licensee. Here they are. The Hiram Percy Maxim Award recognizes a radio amateur and ARRL member under the age of 21 whose accomplishments and contributions are of the most exemplary nature within the framework of amateur radio activities. Nominations for this award need to be made through your ARRL section manager, who will then forward the nomination to ARRL headquarters by March 31, 2018. The ARRL Microwave Development Award pays tribute to a radio amateur or group of radio amateurs who contribute to the development of the amateur radio microwave bands. 
The nomination deadline is March 31st. The AWRL Technical Service Award recognizes a licensed radio amateur or a group of radio amateurs who provide amateur radio technical assistance or training to others. Again, the nomination deadline is March 31st. The AWRL Technical Innovation Award is granted to a radio amateur or a group of radio amateurs who develop and apply new technical ideas or techniques in amateur radio. The Knight Distinguished Service Award was established to recognize exceptionally notable contributions by a section manager to the health and vitality of the AWRL. The nomination deadline for this one is April 30th. The AWRL Board of Directors selects recipients for these awards. Winners are typically announced following the board's July meeting. More information about these awards is available on the AWRL website. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the Propagation Forecast for Friday, March 23rd. If you were listening last week, you might remember our discussion of the giant gash that opened up in the sun's magnetic field. Well, the opening is even larger now, and the outpouring stream of solar particles is now aimed directly at us. By the time you hear this, you will probably be experiencing some geomagnetic storms, some of which may be intense. The timing could not have been worse with the CQ WPX SSB contest taking place this weekend. 20 meters is likely to be in mediocre shape as a result, and the higher bands will be mostly dead. Your best bet is to head on down to 40 or 80 meters. On VHF and UHF, the West Coast is primed for tropoducting over the next several days, but there have also been reports of some big band openings on two meters in the central Midwest as well. And now, with his segment on working amateur radio satellites, here is AMSAT North America's own Bruce Page, KK5DO. Many hams are giving satellites a try for the first time or are coming back after a hiatus. Some are able to make a successful contact and others become frustrated by not hearing the satellite or being able to have their signal heard. One of the pages at AMSAT.org that will be very useful for you is the Satellite Schedule page. There you can find what mode the satellite is in and if it will be turned on when you are expecting it. You can visit AMSAT.org slash satellite hyphen schedules for the latest information on your favorite satellite. If a satellite is in digital mode sending pictures, you will not be able to use the FM transponder, and you might think there's something wrong with the satellite or your equipment. It is a good idea to check the page once or twice a week and see what is happening. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. On the same launch as an amateur radio satellite in January from India, some tiny 0.25U CubeSats called Space BEEs not to be confused with these fantasy insects in the Futurama TV cartoon, also went into space when they apparently should not have. Last December, in a letter to their developers, Swarm Technologies of Los Altos, California, Anthony Serafini, the chief of the FCC's experimental licensing branch, advised that the FCC was unable to grant the company an application for an experimental authorization in association with deployment and operation of spore spacecraft smaller than 10 centimeters in one of their three dimensions. In dismissing the application without prejudice, the FCC said the spacecraft were below the size threshold at which detection by the Space Surveillance Network could be considered routine. The FCC said the proposed addition of KU-band radar reflectors would overcome the issue only with respect to the small portion of the SSN that utilizes the KU-band. In the absence of tracking at the same level as available for objects of 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, and in the event of a conjunction with an operational spacecraft, the ability of operational spacecraft to reliably assess the need for and plan effective collision avoidance maneuvers would be reduced or eliminated, the FCC said. Last week, the FCC emailed Swarm Technologies that its application for an additional experimental authorization had been set aside and was in the pending status for further review. The International Bureau requested that the grant be set aside in order to permit assessment of the impact of the applicant's apparent unauthorized launch and operation of four satellites 
and related statements and representations on its qualifications to be a commission licensee. Swarm told the FCC in an appendix to its experimental radio authorization application that it was seeking to demonstrate two-way communication satellites to serve as a cost-effective low-data rate Internet of Things network, connectivity solutions for remote and mobile sensors. The FCC is responsible for regulating commercial satellites, including minimizing the chance of accidents in space. It's feared that the four space bees now orbiting the Earth would pose an unacceptable collision risk for other spacecraft. If confirmed, this would be the first ever unauthorized launch of a commercial satellite. Radio Scouting, the adventure of youth amateur radio, is the theme for the 43rd edition of the International Amateur Radio Expedition, Ham Radio, in Friedrichshen, Germany. Here with the details is Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX, reporting from ARRL headquarters in Newington, Connecticut. After taking place in late June for many years, Europe's largest amateur radio gathering has more recently become a bit of a moving target. This year's show will shift to June 1 through 3rd in conjunction with the 69th Lake Constance Convention, both organized by the DARC and the separate but concurrent Maker Fair. Ham Radio once again will host a software-defined Radio Academy conference as well as a ham camp on Lake Constance for younger visitors and youth groups. In 2017, when the events were held in mid-July, the attendance for both events was more than 17,100. This year's event features some 180 exhibitors from 30 countries. President Rick Roderick, K5UR, will head ARRL's contingent to Ham Radio 2018, which will also include ARRL International Affairs Vice President Jay Bellows, K0QB, Marketing Manager Bob Inderbidson, NQ1R, Field Services and Radio Sport Manager Norm Fusaro, W3IZ, and Radio Sport Administrative Manager Sabrina Jackson. In past years, we have presented exhibits that have shown all of the different settings where radio is used, said the Deutsche Amateur Radio Club Stephanie Hain, DO7PR. This year, we have invited scouts who are active on the airwaves. Visitors will be able to learn more about radio scouting at an exhibition and at a booth at the Friedrichshafen Fairgrounds. In addition, a huge yurt tent and a pioneering tower will be built up on the West Open Air Grounds, Hein said. On hand for the International Amateur Radio Union will be IARU President Tim Allum, VE6SH-G4HUA, Vice President Ole Garbsted, LA2RR, and Technical Representative Dale Hughes, VK1DSH. An informal international meeting of the IARU Member Society representatives is set for June 1st. Germany also will host World Radio Sport Team Championship 2018 on July 12th through the 16th. For those who have never been, Ham Radio 2017 is the focus of an independent video featuring interviews with radio amateurs from many countries. Although the video starts out with German speakers, it contains plenty of English and a few other languages as well. The deadline is April 30th for U.S. schools, museums, science centers, and community youth organizations working individually or together to submit proposals to host an amateur radio on the International Space Station. Contact with an orbiting crew. Contact should be scheduled between January 1st and June 30th of 2019. Each year, ARIS provides tens of thousands of students with opportunities to learn about space technologies and communications through amateur radio. The program provides learning opportunities by connecting students to astronauts aboard the International Space Station through a partnership between ARRL, AMSAT, and NASA, as well as other amateur radio organizations and worldwide space agencies. The program's goal is to inspire students to pursue interests and careers in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and amateur radio. Educators overwhelmingly report that student participation in the ARIS program stimulates interest in STEM subjects and in STEM careers, ARIS said in announcing the contact opportunities. As one educator wrote, it exceeded our expectations. It created a great interest in both amateur radio and in space exploration. Our kids are completely inspired. More than 90% of educators who have participated in the program have indicated that ARIS provided ideas for encouraging student exploration and participation. Some of them even became radio amateurs after experiencing a contact with an ISS crew member. 
Harris is looking for organizations that will draw large numbers of participants and integrate the contact into a well-developed, exciting educational plan. Students can learn about satellite communications, wireless technology, science research conducted on the ISS, radio science, and any related STEM subject. Students learn to use amateur radio to talk directly to an astronaut and ask their STEM-related questions. Harris will help educational orgs locate amateur radio groups who can assist with equipment for this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Proposal webinars for guidance and getting questions answered will be offered on Thursday, March 29th at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, that's 0000 UTC, on Friday, March 30th, and on Monday, April 16th at 4 p.m. EDT, or 2100 UTC. Advanced registration is required. For more details, such as expectations, proposal guidelines, and the proposal form, are over there on the ARISS website. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. From the not-so-secretive studios of the Radio Amateur Information Network, I'm Larry McGlure, KB9DIP, we will travel once again to World War II Germany. A number of civilians known as the French Resistance kept tabs on the German military and high command in World War II. They surreptitiously transmitted decoded data to the Allies at great personal risk. Tom Ferreira, W1TP, an authority on those clandestine radio operations of World War II, spoke at the 2015 Dayton Hamvention. Here's our second and final excerpt from that talk. I'm going to take you now to Norway, to Bergen, and show you how spies operated out of a particular city. In Bergen, there was a group of spies called the Theta Group, and they lived and performed most of their work in a room which has now been called the Theta Room. When Norway was invaded by the Germans, initially Bergen Seaport looked like a row of old buildings. The Germans came, they took over, and the buildings to this day still look very much the same. But if you look at an overhead view of the seaport and the buildings, and you look very carefully, you can find in the very back part of one of these buildings, the Theta Room, located in a very difficult place to get to. It's a pretty good, well-hidden spy locale. First thing you have to do is you have to walk down this long corridor from the seaport to the back of the building. And then, once you're at the back of the building, you have to know to go up these stairs. And you go up to the second floor of this old building. And when you're up in the second floor, you have a bunch of old furniture. You have to walk by the furniture and find your way to the back here. Go through a door and then find your way up a set of stairs. And there's a wooden roof over the stairway, so it looks like it's closed off and unused. But when you finally get there, you find the Theta Room. The door has a rather interesting arrangement on the back of it. This door was barred so that people could not knock it down. There are a lot of heavy hinges, multiple heavy hinges on the right side, and a very, very heavy-duty latch on the left. And that latch had to be moved by an electric motor. And the only way to open this door was to activate that electric motor. And the only way to activate that electric motor was to connect this nail to this nail over here. And you did that by having a coat hanger, and you had to know exactly which of the nails on the door to connect together in order to get the latch to retract. So really a rather clever arrangement. The door will open when you do this, the motor goes chugga-chugga and the latch pulls back. The room itself was equipped with a rather unique feature, a bomb. Uh, and uh, that bomb would be set off if people entered the room and opened the cabinet where the bomb was located. So you can see the trigger switch here, the batteries to operate the bomb, and the TNT explosive. The uh, cabinet looks perfectly innocent, but you would expect that if a German came along and, and started searching through this room, eventually they would say, gee, I wonder what's in this cabinet, and boom, the room is no more. But uh, the Theta Room has been restored by the uh, Norwegian government back to the way it appeared when it was being used as a spy headquarters during the war. There's a radio transmitter with a, an adjustable power supply built into the wall, a couple of radio receivers, a typewriter, an oscilloscope, and 
particularly important a bunch of recognition diagrams so that if these spies were able to see any enemy ships or air and enemy airplanes, they'd be able to identify what these ships and airplanes actually were and send that information back to the British or the Allies. It was very important for the British to know what boats were in various harbors in Norway so that they would be able to bomb the important ones and not just attack randomly. They also had to have a technique for encoding their messages. They couldn't just call up England and say, hey, there's a battleship in Bergen Harbor. That wouldn't do at all. They had to send the messages in encoded form. They didn't have Enigma machines or code machines, so they had hand ciphers. They would take phrases and encode them into five-letter groups, send these five-letter groups by Morse code to the English, and then the English would decode them. One of the things that they were particularly interested in was locating German warships. And so they would take photographs of these warships, and if they were unique enough, they would find some way to get the photograph itself back to England. But in general, they were able to identify what the ship was and send that information back to the British. They would do it in these little telegrams. This is a received a telegram marked secret February 1942, right in the early middle part of the war. Source is Theta, date of information and so on. The message says Tirpitz, which is a major German battleship, is camouflaged with a steel net, canvas trees and snow. It now looks like a peninsula. We believe she has been moved to a fjord or a place with a similar name where and when will be telegraphed later. So that's critical information. The British needed to sink the Tirpitz, and here they're being told where it is. And additional information was included. Patrol boat now patrols this fjord and that fjord and islands. This boat lies up all night on the north side of another place there. There are watch posts in these locations. More accurate details later. There are many U-boats here now and so on. The von Turpitz was lying in the fjord, Saturday, 14th February, between two small islands. She was camouflaged as an island with woods. There is no visible damage, very difficult to see. Later on in May of 1942, the Tirpitz sustained one direct hit aft, which damaged her. This occurred during the raid. She's still lying at her old anchorage. This information is accurate. A pilot reports that several warships were sunk in Trondheim Harbor, also, and so on. All kinds of information. U-boats are being repaired daily in the floating dock at another location. So really critical information. Again, Theta information, uh, ships that pass through Bergen on a northerly course. This evening we're at Neisenau and Prinz von Eugen, two huge military German ships, and they were escorted by seven destroyers. The aforementioned battleship towed to was not Tirpitz, but a battle cruiser. There are 90 airplanes now at such and such. Six troop trains leave Oslo daily for Trondheim. Ideal information if they want to bomb a troop train. 200 airplanes passed uh, on Sunday going north. This is particularly uh, useful information. The 50,000 German troops at Aarhus, Denmark, are waiting to go to Norway and can only go by the sea route from Denmark to Kristiansand. So ideal information for the Allies to use in tracking this. The Theta Room received news from a friend in Norway that a big roundup occurred in an area in Bergen. So they were always being hunted. This last thing says, I'm staying in the secret room until the courier comes. Can he come as early as possible, please? The station must be saved and must continue after I've left. For your information, Christian was arrested, and so on and so forth. A very scary business. You never knew whether you were going to live through the next day. And very brave people were involved in this. The big problem, of course, was direction-finding devices. These uh, radio stations were located wherever they were, and the Germans certainly wanted to find them. They wanted to find them very badly. The technique of direction-finding, for those of you who might not be familiar, is to have two receiving stations, one one and two, both of which have directional antennas, and to move those antennas in a circular direction until you find a point at which the two antennas 
pointed toward the source of the radio information intersect, and that's the location of the sender, within a mile or so of the location of the transmitter. This was done by a number of different kinds of mobile vehicles, a German direction-finding truck in a French town, uh, specifically designated to go around and find these spy transmitters. There were a lot of vehicles that the Germans used for direction-finding, homing in on the spies. Uh, this one has the antenna somewhat hidden under a canvas top. Uh, in this one, uh, since it has a canvas top, the antenna could actually be mounted inside the car. So it was a direction-finding vehicle with a rotatable direction-finding antenna located right inside the vehicle. If you saw this thing coming, boy, you would run if you were uh, transmitting. The operator would rotate the antenna and watch the signal strength meter until he got a uh, peak or a null depending on how the antenna was set up, and then record the bearing to that station. So these things were driving around while Paulette and these other people were transmitting, and these guys were trying to home in on them. The more insidious ones were located in Feisler Storch aircraft. These airplanes could fly extremely slowly down in the 30 to 40 mile an hour range. They're extraordinary airplanes. If you ever get up to the Collings Foundation World War II reenactment in Stowe, Massachusetts, they have one of the few still flying Feisler Storches. And for 400 bucks, you can take a flight in this thing. And you feel as though you can get out and walk. I did it, and it's just amazing how slow it can fly, and it has windows that allow you to look straight down, so it's an ideal observation aircraft. An awfully easy target, however, flying at that speed. Anyway, you had aircraft, but then you also had direction-finding receivers built into suitcases, relatively innocent-looking suitcases, very much like the spy radio suitcases. Probably the most insidious of all of the direction finding techniques was a body-worn direction finder. This guy looks like, uh, well, he looks pretty evil, even without knowing what's under his uh, coat, but uh, if he flashes, you suddenly see <laughs> that he is not just wearing a raincoat, he is a flasher. And underneath his raincoat, he has a complete direction finding receiver and the antenna for this receiver is sewn into the vest so this vest is actually an antenna containing vest and he has this thing around his waist and of course again we're dealing with tube radio so the batteries are pretty heavy in this thing and the readout for this I mean here he is he's just uh, walking along and he just checks his wristwatch and it turns out that the wristwatch is actually a field strength meter and you look at that little dot and it tells him as he moves his body back and forth the direction of the spy radio that he's trying to home in. The antenna is set up so that the line between the person's shoulders points directly at the transmitting station. So he would just sort of look at his time and rotate around a little bit and when he got a null he would know that the spy station was either there or there and then he'd go walk a little bit and do it again and find where the two bearings crossed and he would have a really good fix on where the spy station was. Uh, looking at the inside of this thing we see these uh, strange German tubes that were quite widely used during World War II. If we look at the circuit diagram we have just a normal direction finding loop antenna fed into a high gain superhead receiver. And one of the techniques that the spies eventually had to engage in to avoid direction finding was to use burst transmissions where you would try and get an entire message in Morse code sent in a very, very short time. It would then be recorded on a tape recorder by a receiving station that slowed down. But the technique of sending these messages so fast that you were only exposed for maybe five seconds or less was what really worked rather well because the guy with his direction finding receiver couldn't turn his shoulders fast enough to home in on a five second transmission and consequently they were very important. A lot of time and energy was put into developing burst transmission encoders and again this is nicely covered in Milstein's book. Here is a very early technique called a squirt 
encoder. And what you did was set up these little rods with dashes and dots that corresponded to the Morse code. And then you would run a wire along them. And uh, for the light colored ones, it would be dots and the dark colored ones would be dashes or something like that. With a bunch of these, you could have preset messages that you were sending, like the initial call sign and uh, the kind of information you were going to send. And it was all contained in a little box. So this sort of a basic technique for sending a very fast transmission. Just move your hand down this rod as fast as you can and the receiving station records it and eventually slows it down. So that's sort of a summary of what happened with these uh, occupied areas. Uh, at the end of the war when people finally were allowed to have their radios back, you could see their smiles and they're looking forward to being able to listen to radio stations again without being shot for having the receivers. Thus we conclude our two excerpts from a 2015 Dayton Hamvention talk by Tom Pereira, W1TP, an expert on the clandestine spy radio operations in World War II. You can read a great deal more about the Enigma cipher, the primary coding machine adopted in 1926 by all branches of the German military and high command by visiting Tom's Enigma Museum website, see Rain Sites mention page for the URL. I'm Larry McGlure, KB9DIP, bidding you a very 73. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Foundations of Amateur Radio A question that comes up regularly is one about loss, specifically loss in the coax and connectors between your radio and your antenna. The general wisdom is that better coax gives you better results and more connectors is bad. Anything with double joiners or such like is really bad. So essentially we've been taught that we should have the shortest coax possible with as few connectors as possible. Pretty fair and reasonable, right? During the week I was introduced to a video made by Jim, Whiskey 6 Lima Golf. Jim has a YouTube channel going back a couple of years with about 100 videos. One video is loosely called Jim measures the loss in coax connectors in 100 foot of RG8X. In case you're wondering, 100 foot is 30 meters and 48 centimeters of coax. I know this because the United States of America, despite appearances to the contrary, is actually metric. They defined the inch as being 2.54 centimeters back in February of 1964. Other than driving on the wrong side of the road, they're not too strange, and they talk on the air a lot, so there's that. Back to Jim. He rummaged through his bits box, the one you have, the one that every amateur has, and if you don't, then you clearly need to spend some time being with an Elmer and learning the ropes. Jim pulled out 30-odd connectors, SO239 and PL259 by the look of things, and daisy-chained them all together. Jim has been around the block a few times and has connectors going back to World War II, so he really did find the bottom of his box to make his video. Anyway, he rigged up a testing tool to compare a single connector to 30 connectors. Measuring the difference, showing pretty graphs, lines and scales, the whole bit. He even compared 20 meters to 6 meters and tested both extensively and even redid the test with a kilowatt. Then as icing on the cake, you know the one with a cherry on top, whipped cream on the side, he did the same test with the 30 odd meters of RG8X coax. I could leave you hanging here and let you go and find Jim's video, but that wouldn't be fair if you're currently in the middle of your commute to work like several people I know. So. I'll share the outcome, but if you get the chance, the five minutes of your life that you'll spend with Jim are worth every second. So what was the outcome of Jim's test, you ask? Surprisingly, there was no discernible difference between one connector and 30 connectors in line. Not at 14 MHz, not at 50 MHz, not at 50 microvolts, and not at 1 kilowatt, about 223.5 million microvolts. Using RG8 coax, which sits about halfway between RG58 and RG213 in terms of loss, there was however 22% loss at 14 MHz and 40% at 50 MHz. Does make me wonder if it's the coax manufacturers who have been telling us to buy more coax, rather than join two bits of coax together with a connector. Might have to do that test myself. Better go and start digging through my bits box. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. In preparation for the World Radio Conference in 2019, or WRC-19, there are a number of preparatory meetings that are undertaken. One of these is the Asia-Pacific Region, is the Asia-Pacific Telecommunity Preparatory Group. 
This is the third of five regional summits in the lead-up to the International Telecommunication Union, WRC. The Australian government is hosting this meeting in Perth from March 12th through the 16th and has attracted more than 350 radio telecommunication leaders from over the 25 Asia-Pacific countries. The APT aims to build regional positions on radio telecommunication spectrum allocations to take forward global forums and in particular WRC-19. Representatives from the ITU and other regional groups, including the European Conference of Postal and Telecommunications Administrations and the Inter-American Telecommunication Commission, attended the five-day meeting. Australia has a large delegation, including representatives from the Department of Defense, CSIRO, Air Services Australia, Australian Maritime Safety Authority, Bureau of Meteorology, and industry technical experts. WIA representative Dale VK1DSH is attending and undertaking multiple roles. He is APG coordinator for the WRC 19 agenda items 1.1 ITU R1, the 50 megahertz allocation, and as such takes an active part in the APG meetings. Dale is also the Australian coordinator for agenda items 1.1 and 9.1.6 and represented the agreed Australian position on these two agenda items. Agendas 9.1.6 covers wireless power transmission and it's important that we are able to express our concern about RFI that might be generated by the WPT system. NASA will test a parachute for possible future missions to Mars from NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia on Tuesday, March 27th. Live coverage of the test is scheduled to begin at 6.15 a.m. Eastern Time on the Wallops Upstream site. The launch window for the 58-foot-tall Terrier Black Brant 4 suborbital sounding rocket is from 6.45 to 10.15 a.m. Backup launch days are March 28th through April 10th. The NASA Visitor Center at Wallops will open at 6 a.m. on launch day for a viewing of the flight. The rocket launch is expected to be only seen from the Wallops area. The rocket will carry the Advanced Supersonic Parachute Inflation Research Experiment from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. The payload carrying the test parachute is expected to reach an altitude of 32 miles, approximately two minutes into the flight. The payload will splash down in the Atlantic Ocean, 40 miles from Wallops Island, and will be recovered and returned to Wallops for data retrieval and inspection. The payload is a bullet-nosed cylindrical structure holding a supersonic parachute. The parachute's deployment mechanism and the test's high-definition instrumentation, including cameras to record data. Aspire is managed by JPL with support from NASA's Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia and Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley, California for the agency's science mission directorate in Washington. NASA's sounding rocket program is based at Wallops. Orbital ATK in Dulles, Virginia provides mission planning, engineering services, and field operations through the NASA sounding rocket operations contract. NASA's Heliophysics Division in Washington manages the sounding rocket program for the agency. Launch updates will be available via the Wallops Facebook and Twitter sites. Smartphone users can also download the What's Up at Wallops app, which contains information on the launch, as well as a compass showing the precise direction for launch viewing. More information on the agency's sounding rocket program is available online on the NASA webpage. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. And finally this week, want to get the hottest ticket this summer without standing in line? NASA is inviting people around the world to submit their names online to be placed on a microchip aboard NASA's historic Parker Solar Probe mission launching in summer 2018. The mission will travel through the sun's atmosphere, facing brutal heat and radiation conditions, and your name will go along for the ride. This probe will journey to a region humanity has never explored before, said Thomas Zerbuchen, the Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters in Washington. This mission will answer questions scientists have sought to uncover for more than six decades. Understanding the sun has always been a top priority for space scientists. Studying how the sun affects space and the space environment of planets is the field known as heliophysics. The field is not only vital to understanding Earth's most important and life-sustaining star, it supports exploration in the solar system and beyond. 
In May 2017, NASA renamed the spacecraft from the Solar Probe Plus to the Parker Solar Probe in honor of astrophysicist Eugene Parker. The announcement was made at a ceremony at the University of Chicago, where Parker serves as the S. Chandranskar Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus, Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. This was the first time NASA named a spacecraft for a living individual. Now, if you want to get your name on the microchip, uh, submissions will be accepted until April 27th, 2018. And all you have to do is add your name on the website, go.nasa.gov slash hot ticket. And we'll be repeating this address later on in the story. But the spacecraft, it's about the size of a small car and will travel directly into the sun's atmosphere about 4 million miles from the star's surface. The primary science goals for the mission are to trace how energy and heat move through the solar corona and to explore what accelerates the solar wind as well as solar energetic particles. The mission will revolutionize our understanding of the sun when changing conditions can spread out into the solar system affecting Earth and other worlds. To perform these unprecedented investigations, the spacecraft and instruments will be protected from the sun's heat by a 4.5 inch thick carbon composite shield, which will need to withstand temperatures outside the spacecraft that reach nearly 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. This state-of-the-art heat shield will keep the four instrument suites designed to study magnetic fields, plasma, and energetic particles, and image the solar wind at room temperature. The spacecraft's speed is so fast at its closest approach, it'll be going at approximately 430,000 miles per hour. That's fast enough to get from Washington, D.C. to Tokyo in under one minute. Parker Solar Probe is, quite literally, the fastest, hottest, and, to Nicola Fox, the coolest mission under the sun. Now, project scientist Nicola Fox of the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory says this incredible spacecraft is going to reveal so much about our star and how it works that we've not been able to understand before. And again, if you want to add your name to that chip to be sent to the sun, just go to the website go.nasa.gov slash hot ticket. So go ahead, add your name with me and George, and we'll all go to the sun together. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater, K2CT, on 145.19 MHz in New Scotland, New York, owned and operated by the Albany Amateur Radio Association. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.